Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mystical Ministry Podcast. I am your host, Matthew P. Taylor, also known as the Rev Ra, and I am joined today by my co-host, Eric Halseth, and we have a very special guest, Rue, from the Gospel of Katara Podcast. Hi. <laughs> hey, Rue. Will you um, please introduce yourself to our audience Sure. So my name is Rue, and I am one of the co-hosts of the Gospel of Katara podcast. It's a podcast that looks at the spiritual practices and lessons that are taught in the show Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, I myself am a teacher and a preacher, a writer. Uh, I feel like I'm about to break out into song. (laughs) Please do. I'm a toker, I'm a smoker, no, Um, (laughs) I'm a teacher, I'm a preacher, and I'm a gender-fluid, queer individual who practices Unitarian Universalism, so I use they and them pronouns. Thank you for sharing that. It looks like I just got a message from our other special guests. I think they're going to hop in with us. So, we do have a second special guest today. Our second special guest is Cooper. Cooper, could you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Cooper. Um, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. I have been a Unitarian Universalist now for oh six or seven years it's it's hard to keep track um i I initially found the faith uh in montgomery alabama and um but i I really was able to thrive within unitarian universalism when i moved out to las vegas Uh, i am a special education teacher by trade i teach uh collegially i um occasionally preach So that's just a little bit about me. Well, welcome to you both. Um, So our show currently is focused on reimagining our seven principles. Um, Last year in 2019, Eric and I were at Turning the Tides, which is a camp that's put on by the UU Justice Ministries of California. And while there, um, I was tapped on the shoulder to um, produce a workshop. And then I tapped Eric and asked him to hop in and help out. Um, And it was very interesting because we started this discussion with um, some elders in our community about how can we reimagine our seven principles. And so with this series of podcasts that we're doing right now is we are tapping people in our community to get their input on, you know, what would Unitarian Universalism look like? if we were to reimagine what our seven principles were and how they impact or how they are used in the world. But wait, there's sense. more. Why are we doing this, Matthew? <laughs> what's, what's the point of all this? <laughs> Do you want me to say? Yes, Eric. Please. It's for a, a poster session at General Assembly. So we're, we're putting on a poster session about with the same workshop vibe to it that we did at Turning the Tides, uh, getting people discussing the seven principles and um, the the fact that they are not an, uh, they're not a static document, they're supposed to be a living document. And at this point, they are essentially static. And we've gone well beyond the amount of time we are supposed to have had a serious discussion about what they mean and where they exist in this place and time. So, um, for the two of you, I guess we, since you are our guest today, um, is there any particular principle that really sticks out to you or that you really identify with? I um, have found myself um, being drawn more towards the seventh principle recently, um, which is the interdependence web that connects all of life. I find that when I kind of keep this on the forefront of my brain, I'm able to make better decisions and uh, live a healthier life as far as myself within the environment when I constantly have to remind myself the the impact of of some of my my choices. Um, it, It helps 
when when making those choices because I know that um, there there are a lot of issues with it with it, the environment as far as like human behavior and so you know whatever little choices I can make to help that you know process uh, be less detrimental essentially um, is is what I like to to focus on I find the other um, principles a little bit easier to follow they're they're a little bit more straightforward for me um, as as a queer person and a non-binary person I, somehow I just feel like the uh, inherent dignity or respecting the inherent dignity and worth for every single person is is just natural for me somehow I guess um, being raised in a society that you know kind of tells you you're less than that that you're not whole that you know that that your whole self is not divine um, it really helps when you kind of take us you know take perspective you look at yourself and you're like well, you know what you know I am divine and you know once you recognize that divinity within yourself it's a lot easier to recognize the divinity in others so I, I feel mostly um, connected to the seventh principle because I that's the one that I find that I have to keep reminding myself um, because I mean we are socialized to uh, act in a certain way capitalism definitely has its grip on us and tells us what we're supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to be acting and you know this you know the actions that we're supposed to be taking in order to like quote help the economy and all that stuff especially during you know the shutdown so just constantly reminding myself of the seventh principle is what I, I feel drawn to mm -hmm. It's interesting that you brought up the fact that it, it seems the first six seem uh, a little bit. Uh, what did you say? Uh, natural. They just they natural. just come natural. Well, because Matthew, they added the the seventh principle was added later, right? Yeah, the seventh principle is the youngest principle. Right. That one was, I think, in nineteen ninety five when it was added. Yeah. So it's it's the first six are uh, standalone, kind of as their own thing, and then the seventh was added on. So so your observation, Cooper is historically astute. Mm -hmm. And Rue, how about yourself? Well, in direct contrast to what Cooper was saying, I actually find the first principle to be the one that I return to the most. That's my personal check-in all the time. When I'm frustrated with people, when I'm not feeling like I'm at my best, or I'm not treating other people like they deserve to be treated at as they would at their best. That's where I'm constantly checking in. And I think Cooper, you did say something that was very insightful that like as a queer person, we have to do a lot of work to process the fact the world says that we are broken and that we are not whole. And once we come out the other side of that processing, feeling like we are divine, we are whole in and of ourselves, it is a little bit easier than to spread that out to other people. And yet I still find myself sometimes struggling with it. I like maintaining the foundations of Unitarian Universalism in my everyday life. And that principle is what I'm constantly checking in with. I quote it to my friends all the time. Whenever I'm talking about, I don't know, whenever I get on a soapbox, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that I end up talking about Particularly recently, a subject that's been very near and dear to my heart is respecting pronouns. Mm. Cooper and I have both been very active in our local Unitarian Universalist congregation in having discussions with the congregation, both publicly, you know, when we're given the opportunity to preach at the pulpit, but also privately and in smaller groups, having those discussions about pronouns, because my hope is that if we can get our congregation into a place where that is very easy, then I'm going to be able to welcome in some of my rainbow friends to the mm -hmm. congregation. At least initially, that was my thought. And what I consistently try to remind the congregation is if we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, 
then bare minimum, minimum, is pronouns. It's still a work in progress. You know, it's it's not easy. Like studies have shown that it's easier to go from one binary pronoun to another than to go to they and them. So it is harder for people whose primary language is English to switch to a non-binary pronoun, but we're working on it and we tend to be pretty adamant about it and correcting people within our congregation. So that's... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was just going to say, like, I I like the fact that both of you have chosen the first principle and the seventh principle and having this conversation about pronouns, because I feel like um, both of those principles can also be used when you're talking about pronouns. You know, if we are all interdependent, like if we depend on one another, um, again, being able to honor someone's pronouns is a sign of respect. And it's showing that we are all a part of the same community as opposed to like, oh, no, I'm just going to say what I want to say because I don't care if that makes sense. And I feel like that's something that we sometimes see in our communities is maybe there's a lack of understanding as to why pronouns are so important. Mm. And if we can use our principles to reinforce that, that, that why, that big question, then maybe people will have a better understanding as to why it is so important. The story that I told for my congregation is a story about Mr. Rogers and Cooper's going to laugh because I just love him so much. I gave a whole sermon on him, but there's this kind of famous story about Mr. Rogers getting a letter from a young girl who asked him, have you been feeding the fish recently? Because I haven't heard you saying that you're feeding the fish. And the young girl disclosed that she was not sighted and he decided from then on he was always going to say i'm going to feed the fish now Mm. and he even came up with a little like musical ditty that he played every single time he fed the fish and he did that for the rest of his career and that was something that was free to offer it didn't cost him anything to just say i'm feeding the fish now and he did it way beyond when this child might have been listening because there would be other children like her. Mm. And in that same way, we can offer this. And again, this is bare minimum. You know, respecting pronouns is like step one. But it, it is an important step. And it's something that we can do for free that has a huge impact on the people who it affects. I know that for me, one of my partners gets very, very upset every time he's misgendered. And it can really ruin his day. And I I don't want to see that happen for him ever or anyone. I think also um, we have this idea that um, our congregations are these liberal bastions um, in in all aspects of of life and social justice issues. Um, But, you know... It's, it's not the, the reality that we tell ourselves. It's, it's almost like this lie that we've kind of constructed um, because it, it might be something that we're working up to, but it's not that fully realized vision. And um, I know specifically, like at, at, at our congregations, um, I've had people weaponize my gender identity against me so it's it's not like you know we we preach all of these principles and they're great in theory but in practice there's there still needs to be a lot of work there needs to be a roadmap and um eric was saying earlier that we haven't revisited our principles in a while and they've become kind of stagnant And I I definitely agree with that because you can see how these principles are are kind of like out of practice. We we still, in theory, preach them, but in practice, it's it's one of those things that, oh, yeah, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's not something that people are active in, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Especially when they're when they're Sorry. um Sorry. you know formulating their their views on on specific issues i think 
one of the things that I keep returning to and part of the reason I keep returning to our first principle is that that inherent worth and dignity of every person, even if you're mad at them, even if they've done something that upsets you, even if you don't understand, they still have that inherent worth and dignity, which is why, for example, Cooper's experience having their gender identity used as a weapon is so frustrating and so like heartbreaking because their identity is their identity no matter you know if i got really mad at them and we're in the middle of a fight we're fighting that doesn't mean that that inherent worth and dignity has changed their identity is still that so it's it's why it's i i think that it's the simplest principle to say and one of the hardest to enact in every aspect of our lives well i think that um for the most part you know uu congregations are as liberal they as they say they are intellectually but then where the rubber meets the road it's you know you you make a mistake with a gender pronoun and you get corrected and then you get defensive because i didn't mean to i'm sorry um and then you do it again because it's it's not something that you're actively thinking about so intellectually they will agree that people should you know be respected and you should use their gender pronouns and then it's really hard to act on and it takes work and they just don't do the work but it's a good intellectual place to be for them well i've had people um so a little bit of backstory i like to ruffle people's feathers when um they are um really perpetuating systems of thought uh that um uphold systems of of inequality and oppression within our society um so i really try my best to push back against their oppressive um thinking um and of course this does cause a lot of friction but you know that's something that i have signed up to do because you know that's the something that we need to push people further on um to get them out of their comfort zone but um they they would be like i know you don't identify as a man but and then they would go on to whatever kind of you know rant that they that they've told themselves that is okay yeah, and I think people do that in a lot of circumstances, right? You know, people always find a way to say things that are feeding into their own, whether known or unknown prejudices. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm i sure that there are ways in which everybody experiences that, you know, even I, I, there's there's just so many different ways for people to offer up their prejudices so with that in mind i wonder how our how could our seven principles deal with that like how can and this is in some situations um there was a class i was taking uh last year um and the one thing that i i kept noticing whenever it came to um any of the governing documents and things that were being put forth for the uua they constantly talked about the first principle. But I feel like looking at our seven principles, there are other principles that could be used to help with those things. Mm -hmm. So um, as an example, um, when we're talking about like, like justice, just in general, you know, we have our second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. You know, when we think about people who are being prejudiced and whatnot, couldn't they look towards that principle and possibly see that how are they being equitable when they are trying to find any moment to either use a slur or to to misgender someone you know what i mean so what are your what are y'all thoughts like what what is it about our our principles that can be a redeemer for people if i can say that honestly sometimes i feel like Unitarian Universalists look at the principles as optional instead of aspirational. And there's not a specific roadmap to get them to where they can actually fully live these principles in a, in a healthier, more productive way. So honestly, I feel like 
the principles, while specific, are vague. They don't give people who are kind of like beginning the journey uh, an, a framework or an outline for how it is that they are supposed to live out these principles. I mean, Eric or Rue, do you all have a comment? Oh, I have lots of comments on this. <laughs> Come on, Eric. <laughs> This is a problem with Mm -hmm. Unitarian Universalism is um, we proclaim ourselves non-creedal. We're a bootstrapping individualistic faith that values um, the right of the individual uh, to make their own decisions and live their own life above everything else to the point of being unable to provide any moral guidance to anybody. We don't have, um, as I wrote in a recent uh, sermon, a moral North Star. Mm -hmm. We just don't have one. And Mm -hmm. the principles are an an ethical set of guidelines, but are not a roadmap towards actually how we can live our, our best life from that standpoint. So then I guess my question is going to change a little bit. You know, you both have listed so far talking about a a, a roadmap. What could this roadmap look like? Well, we're non-creedal. What what kind of roadmap can you have when you're a non-creedal faith without making people, you know, get up in arms? Mm. I'm all ruining comments. Well, just in listening to Cooper and Eric talk, one of the things that strikes me is that one of the things I know would really benefit lots of congregations is a cultural shift toward the community. And I think, Eric, you really hit it on the head. This is a very American spiritual tradition. You know, we all have our own individual paths and you don't get to tell me what's on my path. And you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't cross over onto what my path is supposed to be. That feels like a very American thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not any, you know, there's no quick fix, right? This isn't going to change just with a couple of conversations or some board meetings or I actually have been listening to this incredible podcast called Queer Theology, Mm. which I highly recommend. And recently they were talking about beloved community in a way that I found to be very aspirational. And of course, because they are both coming from a Christian perspective, I can already feel like the hackles raising on UUs across the world, like all of a sudden they're really uncomfortable and they don't know why. But there's this really beautiful quote from Acts 2.42 to 47 about the community. And in queer theology, what they did is they identified that quote is how being in the queer community feels. We're able to have a community where we look out for each other, where we sell property in order to give the money to other people who need it. And we are very focused on taking care of each other. And I know that LGBT circles are not the only ones that have this kind of family feel, Mm -hmm. this beloved community. But I know that I have not seen that in UU congregations that I have visited. You can walk into, you know, a Friendsgiving with anybody in my queer circle, and you would feel like you were a member of the family by the end of the night. You would feel so loved and so appreciated. You'd have a ride home if you got too drunk, you know, like... There would be food and there would be different food options if you've got any like weird food allergies like I do. And I have never experienced that within a UU congregation. So to me, I feel as if it's not just about what we put on paper. Mm. This needs to be a huge cultural shift toward taking care of each other. Because if we can take care of each other, then we just kind of like what we were talking about earlier. If we know that we are safe in our community, then it's easier, I would hope, to accept others into that community. I totally agree with with Rue in this regard, uh, as far as putting it down on a piece of paper. I often feel that sometimes that the the policies and all of the regulations that are set forth by the UUA are kind of lost in translation. It kind of muddies the waters for congregations to put into practice. And honestly, it gets frustrating because I, it feels like 
um, the UUA tells the, the congregations that you are self-governing, you are, um, you're, you're able to control your own budget, but then they want to uh, have all of these rules and regulations as far as like, you know, these are these are the the ways that we want you to do it. You don't have to do it, but um, you you should do it this way. And so I I feel like it puts congregations in this weird position of being self sustaining, self supporting, self governing, but ha- having this overarching body like kind of looking over your shoulder. Like, I feel like it either should be one or the other. We should either be self-governing, self-regulating, totally autonomous, or the UUA should take control of all congregations and spread out the wealth to to all of the congregations. So that way they have the control that they they clearly want to have. And I don't necessarily think that having that kind of central, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, complexities that go with any system the bigger it gets right entropy Mm -hmm. is our worst enemy but it wouldn't necessarily be awful if the uua said okay we're gonna take the charge on this because what would happen is that congregations would split off if they didn't want to be a part of that or they would choose to remain Mm -hmm. and the people that remain the congregations that remain would be a little bit it would be easier to make things work within that system Mm -hmm. if people and groups decided to remain in that system. Well, I was going to say one of the the criticisms that I see within Unitarian Universalist congregations is that half of them are there to be Unitarian Universalists and live out the principles and to lead good lives and to help others, you know, to really embrace those principles uh, to the fullest extent that they're able to. And the other half that I see are just looking for a liberal social club where they can have friends. And they're can not putting in the that? work. I was just going to say, can we talk about that for a minute? Um, Let's talk about this because I my, one of my biggest criticisms of... <laughs> <laughs> Cooper, I love She's on fire honesty. today. <laughs> She's on fire. <laughs> she is. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think that this is like a real conversation and, and maybe this can even lead to like a part two or a separate conversation altogether. But, you know, when it comes to talking about our seven principles, in my experience, I feel like people don't have as a deep connection or want to learn more about them. It's more like, if you want to know what we believe, look at those seven things on the wall over there. Or look at the seven things on this this um, pamphlet here. Like, mm-hmm. it's not really engaged in a deeper way. And so for me, like, that's a part of doing this whole series is to get people re-engaged with the seven principles. You know, right now, again, um, uh, in the bylaws for the EUA, it says that the principles are supposed to be reevaluated every 15 years. And it's been more than 15 years since it's happened. Um, I think the last time that there was some actual conversation was either, I think it was like 2006, 2009. Um, I think there was some potential edits that had been brought forth, but then they were, were sent back to the drawing board. Well, since then, we really haven't heard anything, or at least I know I haven't, and I think I'm pretty involved at this point, and there's really no murmurings. Um, Now, there is the mention, and it's still slowly circulating the eighth principle, but even with that, like, there doesn't seem to be as much traction that's being... um, We have this eighth principle that's coming forward to talk about being more aware of um, countering, like, oppressive systems and really like facing racism and, and, and issues of that sort head on. And at the same time, it seems like it's each congregation is slowly having to adopt it as opposed to it being, okay, look, at this general assembly, we're just going to talk about this thing. We're going to vote on this thing. This thing has been happening over the last 10 years. You know well, what I at, mean? Like, there's At the rate action. that it's going, at the rate that it's going, it's going to take 50 years for every congregation to adopt it. You can't wait for that because we're at 14 right now. And exactly. it's been two or three years since congregations started adopting it. Right. Mm-hmm. 
I think one of the things about the eighth principle that really struck me is that it requires action. We can affirm and promote a lot of things, but it's not the same as saying we are going to be anti-oppression. Right. That's what much more active. And one of the things that my girlfriend has said to me recently is that she has reframed the idea of being an ally in her head. So if she says that she's an ally, that's a verb for her that is active. So if I'm an ally, what have I done in the last week? What have I done in the last month? that proves it what can i point to and i think if we are looking at you know don't just look at the principles on the wall don't just look at this pamphlet what did you do last week mm -hmm. that affirmed and promoted the interdependent web that we are all a part of mm -hmm. what did you do yesterday to promote justice and equity in human relations and i think if we made that challenge to ourselves and to each other, we would be seeing a very different kind of congregation spring up. Mm. I mean, I agree with that. <laughs> like, I, I, I think the biggest thing that is a challenge, and I'm trying to say this in a way that does not sound like ageist or whatever, but one of the things that is a reality is in our congregations, they are aging out. And we are at a place where, you know, we're asking for all this action and not necessarily taking into consideration the limitations that some people have. But to me, that also begs the, the bigger question, what are we doing to bring in the youth, the people that are the activists, the organizers, the people that are on the front lines? How are we welcoming them into our congregations? And are we doing that? Like... Like, are we saying that you are welcome here? Your activism is welcome here. You know, your 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 real liberal thought and action is welcome here. I can't tell you how many times I have been the person given the pointed look when somebody older in the congregation says, "You know, we need new people," and then they're looking at me, and they'll look at. Cooper or some of our other friends who are millennials as if we are in charge. We have to be the ones to do that recruiting. And that's a huge part of the reason to circle back to what we were talking about before. That's a huge part of the reason that I decided that I wanted us to have some frank and honest conversations about pronouns because my friends are not going to go to a place where they're going to get misgendered every time. They are not going to accept that. And there are a lot of young people or younger people, I guess, who have gone through a different kind of introspection about themselves and their identity. And it's requiring, you know, I, I've done years and years of work to figure out my, you know, sexual attraction, my gender identity, my gender presentation. That's taken a lot of time. And the older people in my congregation have not had the opportunity to do that for the last couple of years. So all of a sudden, when I come in and I start saying, you have to use these pronouns with me, that's very sudden for them, which I understand. But equally, if we want the younger people to come in, if we want the activists to come in, we have to become the sort of place that they would go to. Mm -hmm. You know, this is advice that... Um, I have heard when it comes to like dating, if you want to date somebody who loves animals, go to a place where people who love animals hang out, like go to a shelter for animals, go to a zoo, like get into groups, join a corgi club. Those are the things that you, you do in order to find the people that you're looking for. And the reverse is also true. If we want to be a beacon for the people we want to attract then we have to be the sort of place where they would want to go to i i, I totally oh, agree well i totally agree with rue um but i think we're kind of like skipping over the the first step in in this regard um it's i think it's not how do we attract 
you know, younger people and youth is how do we retain the ones that we already have? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know that um, I've had the, the privilege of volunteering at Camp de Beneville Pines um, for the last, oh, I don't know, like a year or so. Um, and that place is thriving. Even when we have congregations that literally have one youth member. We have Camp de Venable Pines, which is thriving when we have um, congregations that only have one or two youths. So there is something that's going on at Camp de Venable Pines that is working for our youth. And I know from the conversations that I've had with, with the youth up there, they largely see their Unitarian Universalist congregations as being hella um, hypocritical. We preach all of these social justice ministries at the pulpit, but then the prax when it comes to the praxis and actually, you know, living out those values, it's less than stellar. And so they don't want to be a part of an environment that is not actually living up to the values that they were taught by the same church organization. And I think at DeBeneville, you're seeing a uh, kind of a, a uh, well, it fulfills its own prophecy. The kids who are active in the church from all over Southern California, from San Diego up to Santa Barbara and points further north and uh, east of us as well um, into Arizona and, and Nevada come to camp and they're the enthusiastic ones. And so we see them there. And then like, like they're the only youth from their church. Like our church has one, one youth who's camp aged and she goes every year. And then some like younger ones who are actually just getting into the age where they can go to elementary camp. Um, but additionally, and, and what they're, they're pointing out with the, the kind of hypocritical statement, very accurate observation. Um, and then on top of that, we're so homogenous a group of people in general. I know that, um, you know, we do have uh, congregations that aren't just this kind of homogenous white upper middle class um, group of people um, primarily I'm going to say this primarily heteronormative primarily straight uh, we are about as homogenous as you can get as a faith tradition like there aren't a lot of other faiths that are that are so um, where everybody is is so in line with one another just in terms of how they appear um, and that's a problem because when it comes time to try to welcome new members, if you don't fit into that, you know, homogenous kind of 97, 98 percent, you're all like we're all the same. And here's a couple of people who are different. It's a really difficult thing to walk into. To and be especially. The outsider. Go ahead. Especially to be the outsider who's then. The exception like, oh, look, we're so diverse. Look at these people <laughs> over here. Let us put them on display. Let's put them on pamphlets. Shall we have you met, show Have off? you met our other queer person? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that hits the nail on the head. Or even, oh, you're a young person? Let me introduce you to our other young people. Like, or why don't you just take the time to get to know them yourself instead of like just passing them off onto somebody else? I mean, to be fair, when the millennials come into our congregation, I absolutely do want to collect them. Like, you show up and I'm like, oh, yes, come and hang out with us. Come be friends. Anyway, I, I, I feel there's, like... There's, uh -huh. Go ahead. I was just going to make the joke that uh, I feel like you're constantly going to be considered new until you join a committee. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Within about a month of joining my congregation, I was teaching a class on paganism because, like, that was my thing when I first joined. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I didn't feel like I was new anymore. Mm. I mean, so I, I've had a really positive experience as far as, like, feeling integrated. But I know that in large part that's because I'm white and female-ish. 
and non-threatening mm. by virtue of those things. If I had some other demographics, it's possible that that wouldn't have been true. Right. It's a good time for us to wrap up this first session. Would y'all okay. be willing to come back for a, a second session to continue the conversation? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yay! <laughs> Well, I just want to thank Rue and Cooper for this first session. Um, and I will be reaching out to y'all so we can get something scheduled for the next session. Awesome. Thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> and, and don't forget I, to check out the Gospel of Katara podcast. Yes. <laughs> you can find oh. us on iTunes and Spotify. Yes. <laughs> and then Aru, I'll reach out to you. And if you haven't stuff. watched the show, extra stuff recording. Well, if you, I was going to say, if you haven't watched the show, it's streaming on Netflix right now. So it's a good opportunity to incorporate um, a spiritual practice in your own life. Thank you so much for that, Cooper. Well, until we meet again, this has been the Mystical Ministry Podcast with our series on reimagining the seven principles. Um, enjoy your day, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>